Do you believe in ghosts? Is it possible for your long lost Uncle Bob or Aunt Sue to come and speak to you from the other side? Uh, what does the good book say about communication with the dead? You're about to find out on His Voice today. Welcome to another His Voice Today with Steve Wolberg. Our program today is called Witchcraft Goes Mainstream. I have in my hand here a book called Rocking the Goddess, Campus Wicca for the Student Practitioner by a young man named Anthony Page. And it's all about witchcraft growing on college campuses and in universities across America. On the back cover, it says that Wicca is the fastest growing religion in America and it thrives on college campuses. And then it has a list of bullets, bullet points on the back uh, telling the potential buyer all of the benefits, if they read this book, what they will learn. And here are some of those bullets. It says you will learn how to cast spells in your dorm room and on other, in other crowded spaces. You will understand various Wiccan traditions. You will explore the psychic realm. You can choose the right coven for you. Coming out of the broom closet to your friends and family. Dealing with peer pressure and people who don't understand. You can buy tools cheaply and how to work magic inexpensively navigating the web to make Wiccan friends and forming a student pagan association, securing a meeting room, dealing with a reluctant administration, and much, much more. Uh, again, basically what this book is about is about witchcraft, how it is really exploding uh, on campuses across the United States. And it's not just America, but really it is around the world. Uh, if you are aware of anything that's going on in the realm of, of occultism and the supernatural, then you know that witchcraft uh, has just exploded in popularity in the last few years. Now, what is the reason for this? Uh, I believe there are many reasons, some uh, visible and easy to understand, and some invisible where we need more spiritual discernment. But let me give you some of the main reasons for this trend that we see in our society. Probably the biggest reason is because of the influence of Hollywood, televisions, and movies in the last few years. Uh, there have just been a plethora of programs that have hit the airwaves and that are promoting uh, a pleasant perspective on witchcraft. One program is Sabrina the Teenage Witch, about a girl with supernatural powers who learns to use her witchcraft wisely. Then there's another one called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It, it, it has been extremely popular. Uh, Buffy has a friend in the series. Her name is Willow and her friend casts spells and practices witchcraft. Another is the Charmed series. Uh, Charmed's, Charmed has been watched around the world, these three uh, attractive ladies who use their powers as good witches to battle the forces of evil. That's what uh, the series is all about. That's what they say. And then there's the movie Practical Magic starring Sandra Bullock and Nicole Kidman about two sisters who stay up late, study spell books, and practice magic. Uh, the subtitle on the DVD jacket says that there is a little witch in every woman. Now, when most people, at least in the past, when they used to think about witch, witches or witchcraft, they would imagine, uh, you know, dark, evil, sinister-looking people with big hats and big noses, uh, and they all they only wore black, uh, like the the Wicked Witch in the Wizard of Oz. This was this was the stereotype. But times have changed, and these different Hollywood productions, the television series, the movies, the books that are being written with pictures of women on the cover, uh, they are definitely not sinister. They're beautiful, they're sexy, and as, as uh, teenagers and adults have watched these programs, the uh, practice of witchcraft seems to be quite appealing, quite pleasant, quite attractive to many minds, old and young alike especially to women. But then the Harry Potter series came out, which is no doubt the best-selling series of children's literature that has ever been published by Scholastic. Uh, the movies have hit the airwaves. They've made millions and millions and millions of dollars for those that have been involved in the series. And the Harry Potter series is about a group of uh, young people, teenagers, centered in one boy, Harry Potter, who goes to school, a school called Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, to develop his witchcraft uh, capabilities and his occult powers. 
And just like the other series that I've mentioned, the same is true in Harry Potter. What's happening now is uh, something different from in the past. In the past, the, the witches and the people that were involved in witchcraft, generally, they were on the side of evil and darkness. But in the popular series that are now hitting the airwaves, and I've just uh, scratched the tip of the iceberg, these programs promote the good guys, the heroes like Harry Potter and the others. Uh, they are uh, practicing witchcraft as well. So now you've got the good guys that are practicing witchcraft, and they're using their magical powers to fight the bad people and the, the bad wizards. And so there's been a, there's been a change, uh, especially as a result of Hollywood, and now witchcraft is being presented in a very, uh, as I mentioned, appealing and attractive light. The second biggest reason is the internet. Hollywood is uh, exerting a powerful impact upon people of the world, and so is the internet. If you go online, and if you type in on some search engine, uh, witchcraft or wizards or spells or potions or covens, you will find a, a plethora of websites. And let me clarify, I don't recommend that you do this, but a lot of people are doing it, and there's just so much out there on the internet. There are uh, forums, there are chat rooms, there are online schools that are offering people uh, a short course or a longer course so that they can develop their own witchcraft powers, their magical abilities, and picking up on Sabrina and Charmed and Harry Potter, um, the internet is in high gear to promote witchcraft as well. And I think the combination of both of these is resulting in this uh, trend that we see in our society that is very, very powerful and it's almost unstoppable. Here's one book that uh, you can easily find on walmart.com. I don't recommend that you buy it or read it, but it says that it's a book, it's called Witchcraft and the Web, and it has information about covens and witchin rituals, beliefs, and spell work, and how they are all now just a mouse a mouse click away. And again, this is on walmart.com. It's not some uh, occult bookstore that's you know on the fringes, but there's no doubt that witchcraft has gone mainstream. And when you see books coming out like The Idiot's Guide to Wicca and Witchcraft or Wicca and Rich Witchcraft for Dummies, then you can be sure that we're talking about something that has um, hit the limelight, hit the public by storm, the people that promote and develop these books, what they do is they study the trends. And when computers were popular or started getting popular, they came out with computers for dummy, dummies. And anything that is a major trend in our society, then they put out a dummy book. So the fact that we've got Wicca and witchcraft for dummies, uh, again, it's pretty obvious that, these, that this trend is, is pretty big right now in our world. Now, what's another reason why people are getting into witchcraft? Uh, going back to the book Rocking the Goddess, Campus Wicca for the Student Practitioner, there's a very insightful statement on page 31, and this book says that Wicca attracts the power seeker. So you've got the influence of Hollywood and the internet, but what's happening in people's hearts? You know, why are people gravitating in this direction? Uh, I think personally that one of the biggest reasons is because it's not just because Hollywood, Hollywood is presenting uh, witchcraft in a attractive light, but also because people are increasingly feeling a need in this stressed out world where um, we are increasingly losing control of our lives, people are sensing a need for power, for power. And that's not entirely bad. Uh, I need power. You need power. We all need power. And people uh, gravitate often to witchcraft or Wicca as they call it, which is a religion that practices witchcraft, because they're, they're sensing a need that they, they've got to have some kind of a supernatural power because when they look just inside themselves, uh, the bodies that they have and the natures that they have and the resources that they have just on their own, they're just not enough. So in, in spite of our secular society where uh, the, the public schools and national parks promote evolution, uh, our, our, our people in this world, on this planet, sense a need for something supernatural, something powerful to help them in their daily lives. And so I think that's one of the biggest reasons why people are, are shifting into the craft, because they're trying to find something that, they, that they're lacking. 
generally speaking, uh, as I've researched Wicca and witchcraft, I've discovered that generally speaking, uh, those who believe in the craft and who believe in witchcraft, they believe that in the invisible world, there is a power. And this power is, is, is a neutral power. It's a force. It, you can uh, find it in nature. You can find it in, uh, in spirits. And this power is generally considered, not always, but generally as a neutral power that witchcraft teaches people how to tap into. And once you learn how to tap into it, you can then channel the power, hopefully, for good purposes. Uh, if you channel it for good, then you're called a white witch, and that's what, that's what Wicca claims to be. If you channel it in a direction that is bad or evil, then they consider you to be uh, someone that's involved in dark or black magic. But the idea is that in the invisible world, there is a neutral power that we need to learn how to tap into. It's the same philosophy that's, that's reflected in the Star Wars series, exactly. The whole idea of the Force. Uh, that Darth Vader got into the dark side of the Force. And then Luke Skywalker, he, he learns how to use the light side of the Force. And so it's just a Force, and it depends on how you use it. That is basically uh, witchcraft philosophy. The question is, on, on this program, his voice today, is what does, what does the Bible say about power and about the invisible world? I don't know if you know this or not, but the Bible is really the world's best-selling book. It's, uh, it's more popular than Harry Potter. It's more popular even than um, TV Guide. This is the book of books. It's been around for a long time, and it has the most accurate information about the invisible world uh, from any other source of knowledge. It's God's book. Appearing on programs such as Soul Train, BET, and The Rolling Stone magazine, former hip-hop artist Ivor Myers shares how he was converted to Christ shortly after the release of his first album. Don't miss this amazing story of God's power and grace. To order Escape from the Black Hole for $14.95, call 1-800-78-BIBLE. Order online at whitehorsemedia.com, or you can write to White Horse Media, P.O. Box 1139, Newport, Washington, 99156. And when we look at the New Testament, Acts chapter 26, verse 18, we have a very insightful statement about what's in the invisible world. Verse 18 says that God wants to open our eyes and to turn us from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. The power of Satan to God. Now notice the word power is here used, but it's not an impersonal power. The Bible says that there are two powers. There is the power of Satan. Uh, Satan is a personal being. His name originally was Lucifer, meaning the light bearer, but he was kicked out of heaven, and his name was changed to Satan, meaning the adversary. He's also called the devil. And the Bible says that Satan has power, but that God has power as well. And God is a personal being. And so we have, instead of a neutral power that we tap into and use for good or for evil, in contrast, the Bible says that there are two powers, Satan's power and God's power, and the real issue is which power are we going to connect with? That is uh, what the Bible teaches. Now, not only are, is there the power of God and the power of the devil, but when we look at the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation, we discover that both of these powers have angelic forces that are working with them. Uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, talks about the forces that are connected to God, the good guys on God's side. Revelation 5, 11, says, I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So I don't know how many that comes out to, but it's, it's a lot of angels. So God has holy angels that are on his side and they also inhabit the invisible world. And then there are the forces of the enemy. In chapter 12, verse 9, this is where we read about uh, Lucifer or Satan being kicked out of heaven. The Bible says that the great dragon was cast out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. His angels. So God has holy angels. Satan has his angels. Uh, these forces fought in heaven. Lucifer and his angels lost. They were kicked out. They came down here. It says they were cast out into the earth, which means they're around us. They're in the invisible world. 
And so we've got both sides, and they are personal sides. This is not just a battle uh, between or dealing with neutral forces. We're dealing with personal forces, the forces of God and his angels, and the forces of uh, Satan and his angels. So this is the battle that the Bible describes. Now, once we know that, then we're ready to look at what the good book says about witchcraft and sorcery. Uh, what does it say? Is it presented as something neutral, that you could be a good witch or a bad witch? There's uh, good wizards or bad wizards, good sorcerers, bad sorcerers. What does God's book say? There are many places where the Bible talks about witchcraft and sorcery. Uh, these words are used over and over again in this holy book. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 12, we have a description of occult practices that God tells his people that we should have nothing to do with. And this list is quite comprehensive, and it's, it's very relevant for us today. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 10, it talks about those who use divination, about those who practice witchcraft, about those who cast spells, and about those who try to communicate with the dead. In verse 12, it says that all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And the word abomination is a very strong word in the Bible, and uh, when you just look here, it doesn't say that those that just practice dark magic uh, are, are people that we should avoid or the practices that we should avoid, but it says that anyone who practices divination or cast spells or is involved in witchcraft at all, uh, that this is something that God definitely does not want his children to be involved in. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 23, and you can look it up when you have time, you have a Bible in your, in your home. 1 Samuel 15, 23 talks about the sin of witchcraft. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, uh, gives a list of what, what is called the works of the flesh. Uh, and verse 20 lists witchcraft right in that list. And then Paul says in the next verse that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, God is very clear. He doesn't, uh, there's nothing vague. There's nothing confusing. It's just basically black and white. He says, don't be involved in witchcraft at all. Back to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and the second to the last chapter in Revelation 21, verse 8. And there is a shocking statement about what will happen to those that are involved in sorcery. Verse 8 talks about the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, and the sorcerers. It says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and with brimstone, which is the second death. So when you look at this list of different practices, murder, sexual immorality, uh, unbelief, idolatry is listed there as well, then right in that list is also sorcery. And this book says that at the very end of the world, uh, the sorcerer's fate is not going to be a happy one. And again, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't differentiate between good sorcerers and bad sorcerers, between those who practice white magic or black magic. It says that all witchcraft and all sorcery is dangerous and it is eventually uh, heading into a, into a hot place. That's what the book says, the lake of fire. These are Bible facts that we need to seriously consider. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the, the quest for power. People are looking for power today, and that's not entirely wrong. I need power, you need power, we all need power. But the power that God wants us to have is a power that is totally safe, and it's not going to hurt us at all. And this power is described in, in many places. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, talks about the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross, and how there is power in the preaching of the cross. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 says that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. So the cross is the center of the power that God has to help you and to help me 
and the struggles that we deal with in our everyday lives. Now, uh, there's another dimension to this that I, I just can't, I can't leave this out. When you, when you learn about the power of the cross and the preaching of the cross and what the cross is really all about according to this book, uh, you discover that there is, there is a word connected to the cross which is the most powerful word in the human language and the word is love, the power of love. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 16, which is probably the most famous verse in the Bible, Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So here it talks about God's love. And what did he do to demonstrate his love? It says in John 3, 16, that he gave, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 33 years ago, uh, I was living in the Los Angeles area. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills of Southern California. I grew up in a Jewish home. Uh, it, was, it was a good home, but it was not a religious home, and we didn't read the Bible, and we didn't pray. And as I moved into my teenage years, I took a wrong turn, and the, the powers of evil in the invisible world pulled on my heart and sucked me in. And I got involved in drugs and alcohol and just a lot of very destructive things. But when I was 20 years old, I began to read the Bible for the first time in my life. And when I read this book, I discovered the power of love, the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the cross. And this is what changed my life. And the, the most important decision I ever made was to accept Jesus into my heart. And when I did that, his power came in and it ripped me out of the things of evil that I was involved in. And then many years later, uh, in April of 2000, the year 2000, I made the second biggest decision of my life, and that was to say, I do at the altar, and to um, get married to the woman of my life, and her name was Kristen Renee Demarest, and now she is Kristen Wahlberg, and I learned uh, the joys of marriage. And then a number of years later, the third biggest event in my life was when uh, my wife and I had a little baby boy, and then a little bit later, we had a little baby girl, and becoming a dad, uh, there's nothing, there's, words can't describe what it has taught me about the love of God. In fact, when Seth was born, when he came out of, of my wife's body, uh, he was all bloody, and the doctor laid him right next to me, or one of the nurses, and he was screaming and howling, and just, uh, he was a mess. And I, I looked at him, and I said, Seth, Seth, it's your daddy. And as soon as I said that, the amazing thing is that he stopped crying right away. He put his two fingers on his lips, and he went like this. He moved his eyes back and forth, and he began to look for his dad. And when I saw that little boy do that, I tell you, uh, my heart just changed a thousand times. And I just, I fell in love with this kid, and I realized that this little boy stopped crying because he knew his father's voice. He knew my voice. And I can't tell you what that experience taught me about the love of God. I thought to myself, how much do I love this child? Uh, and then I thought, how much does my father in heaven love me? And as Seth heard my voice and stopped crying, uh, God impressed me that he wants me to hear his voice as he talks to me in the Bible. There's no greater love than the love that is revealed in this book. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And since I've become a father, uh, I have discovered to deeper depths what it means when the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his son. Uh, I can't imagine having to give my son. I love my son. I love my daughter. I love my wife. Uh, and God has taught me more about his love as I've looked at my children. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That love has changed my heart. It's gotten me out of darkness, out of Hollywood, out of sin. It's brought me to a beautiful woman. I'm a happily married man. I've got two beautiful children. And all of this is because of power, because of the power of God's love. Now, honestly, if you, if you look at the religions of the world, and I could, I could list them, many of them, uh, there really is no religion other than the religion that is based upon this book based upon the Bible that reveals such incredible love and power as the Bible 
and as the New Testament that teaches us about the power of God's love in giving his own son to die on a cross for you and for me. There really just is, there's nothing, there's nothing like it. And it is the power of love that people need today. That's the love that you need and that I need. That love uh, is really, if you do your homework on this, it's not found in witchcraft. It's not found in the occult. It's not found in uh, any um, of the popular trends that we see in our world. That love is found in the Bible and it is in the heart, the heart of Jesus Christ. Some time ago when we, my family moved up to North Idaho, my son and I were playing in the snow. And there was a big pile of snow next to us. And little Seth, I think he was about three years old, maybe four, he looked at me and he looked at this big pile of snow and he said, Daddy, he said, if I fell in that snow, in that pile of snow, he said, you would leave me, right? And I looked at him and I said, no, Seth, I wouldn't leave you. And he said, well, what if I, what if I sank down inside? You'd leave me, right? And I said, no, Seth, I wouldn't leave you. And he said, well, what if you didn't have a, sho a shovel? What would you do? And I looked at him and I said, Seth, if you fell down into that snow and I had no shovel, I told him without a hesitancy, I said, I would, I would dig you out with my hands. I would dig you out with my bare hands. And 2,000 years ago, that's really essentially what God did. God sent his son. He revealed his love and he sent his son and he stretched out his arms and his hands were nailed to a cross so that he could reach out to us and save our souls from sin and give us a power in our lives that the world can't give, that nothing can give, the power of his love. John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the power you need. That's the power that I need right now. You have just heard his voice today. We hope you've enjoyed this timely message from Pastor Steve Wolberg, and we want you to know that Whitehorse Media is deeply committed to bringing you many more simple messages straight from the Bible, designed to educate the mind, inspire the heart, and help bring our viewers and their families closer to God. To learn more about Whitehorse Media, or to watch more of Pastor Steve's television programs online, including his powerful new series of two-minute talks, visit hisvoicetoday.com. That's hisvoicetoday.com. If you have any prayer requests, you can email them to us at prayerrequests at hisvoicetoday.com. If you would like a free copy of Steve Wolberg's audio CD, Behold a White Horse, you can call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-78-BIBLE. We hope you will join us next time for another inspiring His Voice Today presentation with Steve Wolberg. Until then, keep the faith.